Hello, and welcome to another edition of Your Public Health Professional and You, a program of the Maryland Public Health Association. I am Lillian Agwebe, your friendly community health educator. This is Your Public Health Professional and You, a program of the Maryland Public Health Association. We have these conversations coming to you courtesy of the Maryland Public Health Association because the Maryland Public Health Association, a member of the American Public Health Association, is very vested in healthy Marylanders living in healthy communities. And so what's your public health professional than you? So in another episode, you know what it is about. But for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is where we bring your public health professional to you. Get some insights in who they are, what they do, and how that has anything and everything to do with you, members of the public. Today, I have a very interesting guest. I was going through her bio and I said to myself, oh my goodness, I cannot wait for this conversation. And so, Kate McGrill, it's such an awesome pleasure to have you here with me today. Thank you so much, Lillian. I appreciate being here. Great. Okay, let's get to know a little bit about you. If you just want to give us some background information about you before we go into the real discussion, let's get to meet you, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kate McGrail. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I work for Suburban Hospital in Bethesda, a member of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, I am in the Community Health and Wellness Department. Um, where I serve as an advocate for community members so that they hopefully will never be in one of our beds. We want people to be healthy, safe, empowered, and really active members of the community. So we support programs and initiatives that help them make healthy decisions for themselves and for their families. Awesome. So when we hear hospitals, we think about people who are already sick, and that's where they go to seek for healthcare services. But public health is really, like you said, about making sure people don't need your services. What do you do to make sure the average Marylander doesn't have to need your services? Wonderful question. It's it's actually, what don't we do? <laughs> um, we wear... Many of you will know if you're in the public health field, you wear a lot of hats. Um, but for my role in the in community health and wellness for Suburban Hospital, everything revolves around the community health needs assessment, which is a process that we conduct as a public health hospital every three years. Um, it's a rigorous data collecting process. We speak with our stakeholders. We it, um, put out surveys and collect and hear the voice of the public and put it all together. Um, and use um, our perspective to prioritize based on the um, supports that the hospital has, our strengths, to identify those priorities that we can have the greatest impact on. And so um, for me in my role, I work with older adults um, delivering programs that um, address cardiovascular health and chronic disease management. And what I do is I go into the community, I learn what they need. We deliver programs such as fitness, um, weekly cooking demonstrations, health education on topics that mean, um, that have a lot of meaning to that specific population. And we keep the, the doorways open continuously to always stay true to that community health needs assessment. I love the fact that you say, you know, we don't want people to come to the hospital. So we actually go out. You are out there in the communities as a public health practitioner. And your work is focusing on older adults, like you said. So I'm thinking about an older adult who's saying, um, I'm old, there's nothing else to do. You know, I'm just going to take it like this. Or I'm old and there's still much about I want to do with my life. When you talk about health education and finding out the needs, how do you identify the communities that you go to and how do you make sure that they're able to participate in your programs? Right. Great question. It's it's first starts with meeting people where they are. 
Um, and that starts with going out beyond the walls of the hospital. The majority of our work is, you know, outside and listening, getting to know people. It's we're we're in the business of relationship building. Um, it's to take the time. Um, I get there through blood pressure screenings. You know, everybody is wants to know their numbers. Not everyone has the equipment to do so. So I go to the community. I meet with individuals one-on-one and we start there. And over time I learn about them and we build a trusting relationship where then I can follow through and deliver whether they need access to a primary care provider, whether they want to join um, a fitness class and they're not really sure if they're ready. Um, I introduce them to the instructors and things like that. Just um, letting people know that we're here when they're ready. Awesome. You build a gap between like somebody who needs to get something done and then connecting them to a healthcare facility or to a gym. And I know that your work really focuses on populations that are um, disproportionately represented in all, either of these chronic conditions. How is that going? Great question. So again, going back to that, that that North Star, if you will, the, the the needs assessment. So through that data collection process that we do every three years, we we know where the issues are. We know where the vulnerabilities are. And so we know, for in my case, um, certain populations of older adults, African-American descent, women um, have a higher rate of heart disease in both incidents and mortality. And so I've been targeting through partnerships that we've built in the community, such as Department of Park and Recreations or Health Department or organizations already in the community to address those things that we found through the data research and then deliver programs that meet their needs specifically. So I'm I'm thinking about somebody in the community who's saying, hey, I have never met you, Kate. You've never spoken to me. I don't know about this needs assessment. How do you know that you're capturing what's happening to me? Because I, I, I imagine that that's how public health works. You, you can't get everybody, but you're able to deduce from the people that you talk to um, what's going on generally in the community. How does that work? Right. Great question. So our partners are where the voices are elevated there's so many nonprofit community organizations in, in where I work, Montgomery and Prince George's County, that that represent those populations, those vulnerable people and groups. And they elevate it. And together at the tables that we sit, um, we are able to address their needs. Great. I think about parks and recreations, that you said. I, I can never forget this. APHA convention I went to and the keynote was actually talking about um, wanting these ideas where doctors will actually prescribe walks in a park or things like that as prescriptions for people. How much of a partner is parks and recreation to the work that public health professionals do? How much of a partner, how important are they to the work that you do and to the public health profession? What would you say? Instrumental. Instrumental. We couldn't do our work without those who promote environments in which people can move safely. We all know that healthy eating, active living is really the crux of um, chronic disease prevention and management. And it's it's never too early to really taste how fun it can be to just move your body. It doesn't have to be formal exercise classes. Although if you haven't taken a Zumba class with one of our instructors, you are missing out. But it could be as simple as walking in your in your neighborhood or um, cleaning the house, gardening, playing. A lot of my my folks that I meet, they they love being with their grandchildren and just being on their feet and active. Um, so community uh, parks and recs and community centers foster those environments where we can do what we love and what just keeps us coming back. That's great. Parks and recreation, very important partners in public health profession, because like you said, some communities, people don't want to go out if they don't feel safe. But if there's a nice park around where somebody can go walk a few laps, you know, there's a playground, you can take the kids, get away from the screen time 
and be out and about and get some exercise, throw that in. And then this is how we do public health. I'm, I'm very excited about the work that you do, but much more excited about how you got here. I see a bachelor's degree in economics, graphic arts or something. And, and, and then here you are, public health, working in the hospitals. Did you always know, obviously not, that you wanted to be a public health practitioner? How did that go? Lillian, I didn't even know public health existed until long after my I graduated with my undergraduate degree um, in economics, accounting, and studio arts. So I was living in a completely different world. Um, and then I was, you know, had the itch for grad school. And also in the news around that time was the Affordable Care Act and all the wonderful things that were going on in the greater Washington, D.C. area. And I, I knew right away that that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be part of the history that was being made to fight the inequalities and inequities that existed in our healthcare system. Um, at the time, I was an internal auditor for uh, a very large multi, multi-entity enterprise in the Northeast. And I said, this area of health is so complicated, so complex. I want to learn more. So I, I got myself down to Washington, D.C. for uh, a master's in public health. Um At which point I decided to pivot immediately out of what made sense, which was healthcare administration, um, into something 180 degrees on the other side of public health, which is community-oriented primary care. And I fell in love with just working with people at such a small local level, really listening to their needs. Um, And and the rest is history. I've been in community health ever since. Awesome. And you've been in community health and you're also uh, a member of the Maryland Public Health Association. I wanted to get some insight on what would you say are the benefits of, I know you're on the board and and, and you're a treasurer. We'll talk about that. But first, I just want to get some insights on joining the Maryland Public Health Association itself. You know, how has that worked for you? What what what, what interested, what motivated you to join it, you know, and what have you found from joining it? Public health, I hope everyone learns this, is such an inclusive, accepting community that, you know, everyone you meet in this community is always has something to help you learn, network, connect. So I actually met the the recent past president Jody Gann of American University through Suburban Hospital um, in, in our her health promotion class I was interviewed um, for her students and she invited me to join and right away um, offered me to sign up to um, be elected to the board and so I, I it's all about taking risks to do to do something that challenges you. So um, I have really, really appreciated my time um, as a member and a board member, um, learning about all the wonderful things that Maryland Public Health Association offers to our members. Every committee and aspect of our organization is so important. But again, the one that brings me back full circle to why I came to the greater Washington, D.C. area mm-hmm. was because things happen here. Policies yeah. are made, changes are, are, are in. In, changes are influenced by the work that's done here. And mm-hmm. so I really want to highlight today the the amazing work our advocacy committee does to um, promote public health in the state of Maryland and invite anyone who's curious um, about what that involves is to, to come and learn more. You'll have the opportunity to, to write testimony, to speak in front of elected officials and see changes made because of what we stand for and um, to be part of that history and legacy we leave in Maryland. You know what? Our next session of your public health professional on you, we're actually talking to our advocacy committee coach. Yes. So we're going to get some more insight into what yes. the advocacy committee does actually and how they get their work done. That's and wonderful. if you are sitting on the board as a at the treasurer of the association, you are a CPA, you're a public health professional, and some economics in there. How do you see all of that 
coming together. Is this a very, I imagine that this is a very small group. Have you run into a lot of public health professionals that are also CPAs? I'm the only one that I know of so far. <laughs> so uh, if you're if you're out there, find me. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I was thinking about this question and the I see a lot of parallels with the role of the treasurer or being a, a certified public accountant in public health because, you know, we're in public health, we're taking care of people, we're making sure they're safe and protected and living up to their potential. And in my case, as the treasurer, I'm doing the same, it's just a financial asset. Awesome. And I want to keep those assets safe. And then I want to use those assets intentionally and efficiently so that the programs and causes that MDPHA stands for can have and we invest in have a positive impact for our state and our communities. So, you know, in 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 public health, we do a lot of measurement and evaluation. So when I'm doing my bookkeeping and monthly reporting, that's the same. And of course, sustainability in public health programming is always forefront. And I want to leave this legacy of such a historic affiliate of the APHA better than I found it. So I take my role really seriously. I love that I have this background that can influence and elevate um, such a really strong and important organization. Oh my goodness. I'm so, I don't even know the word to use by your analogy, taking healthcare, caring for people to caring for money and making sure that you can do as much just as we want to make sure that people can do as much. So I'm going to ask you to to talk to somebody who's out there and somebody who's like, like you said, doesn't know public health exists or may actually know public health exists, but maybe in another profession right now. And, and, and they're thinking, I, I, I'm never going to be able to cross over. How hard or easy is it to cross over? And what's what can be a motivation for somebody that's out there and sitting on the fence? Well, they say, you know, the the wor- the things worth doing are, you know, have a challenge. So I will not say it was a, a very one-to-one switch. Mm-hmm. It did take some time and a lot of patience, but um, I kept going back to my undergraduate experience in, as a, at a liberal arts and Jesuit school where we were thought we were taught to think outside the box, creatively, questioning. And from multiple perspectives, as well as our motto, Jesuit's motto of men and women for others. So at the core of Kate McGrail is men and women for others and to think outside the box. And if if you're if that calls to you, regardless of your background, there's a place for you in public health. Again, going back to such an inclusive and supportive community, it will happen. And um I think it did take time for the whole, you know, financial niche uh, to kind of find its way. uh, Finally, in the in my role on the board uh, of the MDPHA, but to transition into public health, it touches so many aspects of our life, um, whether it be public safety, finance environment. Um, so if there is something that calls to you, will, public health will find a place for you. Awesome. I, we always say that on your public health professional and you, that there's always somewhere for you to fit in. You can be an epidemiologist if you're into numbers. You can be a nutritionist. You can be a community health educator. You can be an advocate. You can be a biostatistician. Yes. And- Music and art therapy. I mean, I've been teaching seniors fitness for as a substitute instructor if one of my instructors doesn't show up so there's always a place for you to be flexible fun creative and have impact and um I think for me to transition out of the professional world of accounting and finance and into public health is just the perfect merger of using both your head and your heart together. And when those feel in balance for you, you've known, you know, you found a place in public health. H and H, your head and your heart, a public health. I like that equation. 
your head plus your heart, they just go public health or public health, whatever way it can be a bi-directional equation, but whatever it is we're saying, we're saying that public health works for you. We like to have these conversations, let the public get to know who public health professionals are, what they're doing. But we also want to talk to public health professionals who are in the state, who are not members of the Maryland Public Health Association. Like, what are you doing? And can you tell us if somebody is a practicing public health professional in the state of Maryland, not a member of the association, or a member of the association and not on any commu- committee serving or doing something? I mean, what's, what's the message? What do we stand to gain? What do people stand to gain by coming to the association? And how does the association benefit by having all of our colleagues come and join us? It it opens doors. You have the opportunity to meet some really passionate, creative, dynamic individuals who represent really important causes across the state. Um, And we we support bringing them together to elevate their causes, their voices, to advocate, to make change. Um, so yes, please, if you're a member, be more of an active member. If you're not a member, reach out and, and ask us questions so that we can support your journey um, as hopefully being a member of our organization. Great. I've always been a fan of the Affordable Care Act. Today, I have another reason to be pleased about the Affordable Care Act even more because I now know that it was a motivating factor in getting Kate McGrill to become a public health practitioner. And so we have been talking to Probably the only, we don't know if you're out there, let us know and join MP, uh, MDPHA, but the only CPA that is also a public health practitioner taking all the work and all her knowledge from practice, from accounting to make sure that we're keeping our money safe, but also going out into the community and working with our seniors and really addressing those factors, even though she works in a hospital and that's what public health is about. We don't want you to come. The hospitals are there to provide services if you do need them. But if we're able to prevent you from coming, that works for us just fine. Kate, are there any last words you want to share with our audience before we round up today? Reach out to us. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Ask questions. Come to our events. Just engage the doors are always open. You never know what opportunity is going to fall into your lap. That's how I got here myself. So um, please just reach out and engage with us. We we are ready for you. We are ready for you. We are out here working for you, members of the community here in the state of Maryland, the Maryland Public Health Association, affiliated to the American Public Health Association. You can send us an email, get info at mdpha.org. You can check our website, www.mdpha.org. You can follow us, like Kate said, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and, and come and connect with us. Because guess what? We are going to continue to prioritize Marylanders living healthy lives. You may not see us, but we are out here working for you. But we'd like to get to know you. We'd like you to get to know us. So keep watching your public health professional and you. Like I said earlier on, we're coming to you next episode, talking to our advocacy committee, because policies have to change for things to happen. Laws have to change for things to happen. And we're making sure that we're working with partners across the state to make things happen for the state of Maryland. My name is Lilian Agwayegbe. I am your friendly community health educator. Glad to have brought you another episode of Your Public Health Professional and You, a program of the Maryland Public Health Association. I'd like to say thank you to my guest, Kate McGrill. Again, I'm just going to say for as long as I can, probably the only CPA public health professional in the state of Maryland right now. And Kate, any last words, goodbye to our audience. Thank you. I'll see you at our next networking event. (laughs) Great. We'll see you at our next networking event. Thank you for joining us. Bye.